Okay, we're live. Cool. I'm just going to introduce um, the show. I'm going to cut this later. <laughs> okay, good evening, everybody. It's another edition of Genovision Media Let's Talk with. And today we're joined by Daryl Harper. Um, Daryl is a very successful entrepreneur and he is a motivational speaker. Um, who trains people, he's been training for a number of years, and today he's going to be talking to us about the psychology of money. Maybe you've heard of, of um, the, this analogy of the psychology of money before. Um, you might have heard of money mindset, you might have heard of um, you know, how, how to deal with money, successful people, do certain things, unsuccessful people do certain things. So I really think it's important that it, has, it is broken down because we have a situation like, well, first of all, we have the situation of dealing with paper money, um, paper money, you know, you exchange. So you have we had to deal with getting over maybe exchanging with gold or exchanging with resources into the paper money. And now we've gone into the situation where we're dealing with digital money, which is a whole to us. So I think I've had a lot of interesting conversations this week, and um, hopefully I'm going to put um, a couple of the questions to Daryl um, so that he could kind of open our mindsets um, regarding these types of things. Um, but first of all, I just want him to introduce himself and tell us um, what his kind of understanding is and then go into the psychology of money. So hello Daryl. Hi Genevieve. So please introduce yourself and tell us um, what you're going to be talking to us about today. No problem. I will first of all correct my title. I'm not going to um, label myself as a, as a motivational speaker. I, I just speak and if people get motivated or inspired or provoked um, that, that's, that's simply what I do. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about my background. Uh, my background is actually teaching. So I used to teach for 10 years in a college, teaching uh, media, funny enough, teaching filmmaking, video production. And um, just felt like the, the, and I love, to be fair, I loved it for about eight years, but completely, completely for that, I love it. I just felt like the whole educational system had changed. It was, I worked in a college, I worked in FE, so it completely changed. It was less about, so it was less about results, it was more about bums on seats. So the students were still there at the end of the year, the college got its funding, and if they weren't there, they didn't get as much funding. So they didn't really care about the results um, per se. All they cared about was keep them, retain them, so they could get their money. Um, and that's not why I went into teaching. You know, tr tr put it this way, you, you don't go into teaching for money. You go into teaching, you should go into teaching because you have a passion to help people and see change in people's lives. And I just didn't feel like I was able to do that. So I... I had sacked my boss in 2010 um, for a number of reasons. You know, my granddad, father, my granddad passed away. They wouldn't allow me to attend the funeral, or they allowed me to attend one day not, instead of two. Cousin passed away. They told me I couldn't attend the funeral. Told me it had to be if it wasn't a parent, uh, grandparent, sibling. Um, I wasn't able to attend, and I just realised at that point when people paid you a salary, just feel that they have so much control over you, your time. Um, so I, I left my job. Um, after 10 years of working there and I went into teaching finance and just really educating people about money and finance and teaching them the things they should have learned in school but were never told in school um so that's that's what I've been doing now for the last last nine years actually the last nine years of my life I've dedicated to teaching and educating and empowering people with the right information so they can make the right choices and right decisions themselves concerning concerning money so that's a bit about myself and my background Genevieve Very more complicated, very slow. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, what made you um, build up the concept of um, that the psychology of money? Um, I don't know if I've, I've brought the, the the concept. Uh, I just found some mentors that that worked in finance. They've been in finance for over thirty. They well between them over sixty years. They're multimillionaires. And uh, they taught, me, they they mentored me and trained me about money. I, I think where where my passion came from 
is I, I'd realized and I'd witnessed what a lack of money does to families. You know, my, my parents were together for 18 years. They were married for 12 of those years and separated when I was 15 years old. My mum got severely depressed and she overdosed and she was in a coma for four days. And that was tough because at, at 15 years old, you know, suddenly like that, you, you have to learn to grow up real quick. You know, overnight you become the man of the house. My dad took me to work with him on a building site over the weekends to pay me a salary so that I could pay the mortgage. So at 15 years old, I took on mortgage payments. At 18 years old, the mortgage was officially in my name. Uh, I bunked school uh, just before my GCSE exams for about three months because I was scared that when I came home, I was going to find my mum dead because she was quite suicidal at that point. Uh, however, bunked school for three months um, and I was marked in in every um, I was marked in in every single register, which tells you how screwed up the whole educational system can be. Uh, also tells you how gifted and talented that I was because not, not get caught for to bunk school for three three months and not get caught. That's a gift. You just need to know how to operate that in the right arena. So I understood my, where my passion for, for teaching money and finance came from my experience. Um, I didn't want to see another youngster go through what I went through just because, because of a lack of money. So I don't know if I brought up, if I brought up the, the concept. I didn't create the concept. I just found in, there was a need. There was a need for financial literacy. Um, it's not in the educational system. I know they were talking about it. It may even be in there now. But in my opinion, and this is my opinion, you know, you know, the whole the whole government, the whole thing is based on people being in debt. Do you know what I mean? If people are in debt, then then that's how the economy works. So it's about empowering people with the right information, the right facts, the right knowledge. And the funny thing is, most of the informa- all the information is out there. Just people just won't go seek and look for it. And they don't and sometimes you, you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what you're looking for. And I think the main thing as well is the financial sector has made finance sound so fearful so people are scared to 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 act, to do certain things people are frightened to do certain things and when you're scared more often than not you you get paralyzed by your fear where if you just made it interesting and fun people tend to learn more so i don't know if i, I didn't create this concept of the psychology of money i've just learned that um there's a need there's a real need for it That that is very true because I suppose when you look at even the language that is used and the way that things are um, described in finance, it can just go over a lot of people's heads. So if they don't understand um, the concepts of um, how things work, um, because they were never taught at school, and um, you know maybe our our parents wasn't taught and things like that, it's very difficult. To, um, I suppose when you get to a certain age and you have to do certain things, we just kind of go with the flow and we don't really attempt to, you know, gain certain kinds of types of knowledge. So I can really understand and it, it's amazing how you turned like all the negative things in your life um, into something positive and, you know, whatever you went through, um, you, you just made the best out of it so that that is really inspiring as in itself so um just go into what you know v, can i jump in very quickly sorry to cut you it, it, it's funny just want to cut touch on two things if i if, if i don't say it i'll forget it's funny because you mentioned about the language and it is so true because they, even things like the word debt you know they, they rename it credit so they take this this negative word and call it credit so it's actually not a credit score that you go and get it's a debt score it's a score to see how much debt you've been in um people love being in credit you know like having credit on your phone like being credit on your bank account like being credit with, with certain banks and and, and uh, certain uh bills that you pay but it's not a credit score it's a debt score so you've just renamed it um in regards to my life to be honest with you you know some people t- say they find it inspiring and motivating it just is what it is do you know what i mean it's it's you you get dealt a certain you get dealt certain cards in your life and you just play them um you don't sometimes you don't have a chance you don't have an opportunity to to trade your cards so i don't see anything that i that i've done or achieved as inspiring i just see it as i, I don't know any different does that make sense i don't it was just everyone gets dealt certain cards and you have a you have a choice you have a choice to play them or or, or I don't know if you have a choice to trust them in, but you can you can change, and um and that's it. And I think 
for me. I'm just very much a realist. So I don't know how this interview is going to go. This conversation, let's say, let's call it a conversation. I don't know how this is going to go, but I just, I'm just real. So some people, some people might start subs- unsubscribing to your station, Genevieve, because I kind of just call the same as it is. I don't throw those shadow punches. I just say what I've got to say. And there's two things in life that have become two of my biggest gripes in life. People that p- complaining about things that you cannot change, because you can't change it, why are you complaining about it? And then complaining about things that you can change. Because if you can change it, then change it. Stop complaining about it. So I did, the circumstances that I'd been through, I didn't complain about them, couldn't change them. I just dealt with it and got on with it. And you know, life bills still need to be paid. The mortgage still needs to be paid. Mum still need to be looked after. So it was just the circumstances. And there's other people in the world that had more challenging things than me that make my stuff look like kind of a child's play. So it just is what it is. Sorry to cut you. I just wanted to say that. No, that that's um, that's very important because I think even even before we even start talking about money, um, we need to have a a view in life that we're actually going to take our hundred percent responsibility for whatever stage and whatever you know financial condition that we're in, because a lot of the time we will say, oh well, our parents were poor, so or or we was always taught not to. Um, you know that money was evil and you know all the stories that we tell ourselves um so that we can stay in the same condition almost like we're trying to get away from actually learning what we should learn Mm. and you know even the fact that you said debt is really credit is really debt i mean how many people actually really think like that even though you know subconsciously yeah. like if, if you don't bring it to the forefront of your mind and actually have that revelation you're not you're not really gonna get any further than that so yeah. it's it's so important um so yeah so just go into the psychology of money and what that actually means what we i mean we understand like having a relationship or you know, the psychology of the mind. What is psychology of, of money? I think it's a couple of things. I think, you know, it's just ha- having an understanding, having a real understanding of how money works, how money flows, um, and what direction it flows in. And often, you know, they say, they call money currency. Cur- currents are supposed to flow. Um, if it just flows around in the, in the same area, you know, in and out of your account, it's just, you know, it's like a dead sea. So it has to flow in some way. And it's just having that understanding about the psychology and your mental state. People that think a certain way tend to make a certain amount of money. People who don't think a certain way tend to not make a certain amount of money. So it's really about the psychology that you have and your understanding that allows you to make and create more wealth for you and your your family. And it's so funny, you know, I think you mentioned the thing responsibility and the challenge with most people when you you say to them, take responsibility, when people hear that word responsibility, they think they think of blame. You know, take responsibility. They th- they think of blame, but if you break down the word, it means response able. That means you're able to respond. So so make a change. Do, do you understand what I mean? So people don't look at it in, in that way that they actually have the ability to respond to to certain things. And your your mindset really when you when you grow as an individual and you grow personally your income grows in line with your personal growth and there's a there's a there's a ceiling that you will always get to unless you grow as an individual and as a person so it's just a it's just a mindset that the facts the facts will show you that 95 percent of people in the uk are still working or dead broke when they get to 65 or 67 and 90 and the other five percent are still are financially independent or wealthy and the, 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 in my opinion, the three reasons why 95% of people are, are still working or they're broke at 65 is the 95% of people, or the 5%, I should say, the 5% of people think completely differently to the 95%. They have a different mindset, they have a different attitude, they have some form of financial literacy. Uh, so they know what to do with money. And if they don't know what to do with money, they know someone that does. The second thing is not luck, it's not chance, it's just a plan. And they work and implement the plan. They say faith without works is dead, so they've done something. I say the third thing is the majority, not necessarily all, but the majority of those people do not have a job. They have a business. Because um, a job will pay you just enough money so you show up to work on time. 
and then most people work just enough so they get sacked the next day we all know what job stands for job just over broke jack us of the boss jump of a bridge whichever one you prefer because the job income was never meant to stretch that far most people get paid enough and they want to pay their bills their gas their rent the electric the mortgage rent but the job income was never meant to stretch that far it's supposed to pay you enough so you can survive it just doesn't pay enough so you can live and the majority of people actually want to live and not just survive and when you hear those stats those those stats if you are a logical thinker and you hear those stats and you go into work the next day and this is what i did i went into, when i heard those stats that 95 percent of people are still working are dead broke at 65 i went into work when i was a teacher the next day and i looked around at everyone i looked at all the people that were 55 60 65 just hanging on for their pension and i said there is no way on this earth that i'm going to do that I could, I could see it didn't work i mean uh, um, imagine this imagine you are 65 years old you have worked for the last 40 years of your life so since you were 25 and you're 65 and you're in no position to retire comfortably and now you're having to work for the next 5 10 15 years just to live through your retirement don't know about anyone else but that scares me and fear will do one of two things it's going to cripple you mentally or physically so you never move or it's going to motivate you so you don't become a part of the 95 percent but you become a part of the, the, the five percent and I, I don't believe in failure I always said i don't believe in failure i believe in feedback however However, I was thinking about this the other day. If I got to 65 years old, and this is just me, this is my opinion, um, please take this in the spirit that's intended. But if I got to 65 years old and I was not in a position to retire comfortably after the 40 odd years, I've worked for more than, 40, been more than 40 years of my life. My dad had me on the building site when I was four years old. It's like child abuse, to be fair, um, but, but I enjoyed it. But I'd, I'd been on the building site. For, for when I was four, obviously carrying one brick at a time and, you know, making tea and all that sort of stuff. But from the age of four, he had me on the building site up until the age of 18. But let's say you, the average person works, for, works 40 years of your life. If I got to 40 years of my life and I can't retire com comfortably, to me, that would be a failure. In, in, in my world, in my life, that would be a failure. Because you can, you can, let's use the word fail, you can fail in other areas of your life, but it's okay because you can make a recovery because you've got enough time to make adjustments and changes. I get to 65, 67, 70 years old, I'm still working out, not out of choice, but out of necessity. I don't have that much time to make any changes. That will be a failure for me in my world, in my life. And the only way that's going to change is if I change what's going on in here. And the funny thing is, Genevieve, most people or everyone is about six inches away from success. That's the space between your left ear and your right ear. Six inches away from success and the 18 and the 18 inch journey from your heart to your head. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's really that simple. You change the way you think up here, you can change most things in your life. And, and the reality is, most of the a lot of the successful people that you think, I can't remember what your question was. I just got to go on a rant now. But the, a lot of the people that make it financially, they never went to university. You look at the Bill Gates, the Richard Bransons, the Alan Sugar. They never went there because they never got caught in this scholastic system of, do you know what? Go to work, go to college, get a, get a, get a good grade, and you're going to go to university, and then you're going to get a degree. You're going to end up with a PhD. You know what PhD stands for? Poor, hungry, and desperate. They end up with all of those. No disrespect to those of you that have got a PhD and all those sort of things. I mean, no disrespect. But the reality is, I taught. I taught for 10 years of my life. I went and showed people how to get more degrees than a thermometer. And at the end of that, a lot of them didn't, couldn't get a job in the industry. I worked in media. A lot of my students would go off to university, come back and visit me. I'm like, what are you doing with your life now after four years? I'm working in McDonald's, sir. Working in Primark, sir. And that's okay because it's an honest living, but it's not what I hope for. Because when you've sown two or three years into somebody's life, you hope that there would be somewhere else. And to be fair, some of them just became lazy. Some of them... I had to change your heart and direction. But a lot of them, when they went to the industry to get get a job, they get told that they need to have some experience. But how can I get some experience? Because no one gives me an opportunity, but well, you need to go and get some. So you end up on this vicious cycle where actually you've gone and got yourself into 12, 25 grand worth of debt and no job to show for it. But you've got more degrees than a thermometer though. But once again, I'm not, there's, there's, in my, once again, in my opinion, this is my opinion, I don't want to see no thumbs down on this, on this, on this video. You can put some thumbs down. You're allowed to have your opinion. But, in my opinion you do not need to go to university for every single job that's out there in my opinion there's certain things yes to become a doctor yes you've got to go to university because no one's going to allow you to do brain surgery on them because you watch a few clips on youtube you know, if someone allows you to do that after watching some clips on youtube yeah you probably need brain surgery to be fair but there's certain jobs you do not need to go to university for 
Genevieve, I can see you cracking up in the, in the small screen. You're putting me off. <laughs> but you just don't need to. You don't need to. You, you got a, if you've got a big enough want to, you will find the how to. Yeah, it's really that simple. Find, have a big enough want to, you'll find the how to. There's a saying I heard the other day, the person that knows how will always work for the person that knows why. Find your why. Then you'll find the people that know how. I can't remember what your question was, Genevieve. <laughs> Oh Sorry. wow, you just covered so many things. Um, I just really wanted you to go over the psychology of money, but you you um, touched on so many key aspects, and it you kind of went from you know the um, what we're taught we should do in terms of okay, we need to go and get a job. So to get a job, we need to get a good education. To get a good education, we've got to go to university, and then we get to a point where we make a point university, we go into the job world and we can't get into the job that we want to do because we haven't got the experience. Or whatever the case may be, I mean, I, I, you know, I've been... Jeffy, for the bus right now, I can just about hear you. Can you, can you, not, can you not hear me? It, it, sounds like, it sounds like one-to-one -one one day when it was Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's me or you. This is what happens when you go live, people. We just, we just keep it. We flow. We flow. Don't worry about the technical challenges. Sometimes it sounds like you're listening. You and me. Do you know what I'm going to do, Genevieve? I'm going to. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Speak again. I can hear you. Let me see if I can make out what you're saying. If I can't, I'll just dial you so I can hear you in my um, phone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sound check. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. 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 Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> you, sound like, you sound like the person that does that song. Computer love. You know that voice? It's like a bit dollar Yeah. Like a bit dollar Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to type over it nearer to my mic. Is oh, it better wait. now? Oh, yeah, go again. Is it better now? Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I was saying um, you covered a lot of things in terms of going through the job market, um, going you know, to university and going to get a job. Um, and that's what we're kind of directed to do from the school. The ultimate, um, the ultimate direction is to get into a good job and, you know, then go from there, build up your money and then hopefully be able to buy a house and whatever not. Obviously, we're living in a time now where I'm a little bit more unrealistic because the first hurdle is, like you said, is trying to get a job in the first place because if you haven't got the experience you're not going to get the job so there's this new thing that i see that's going around like apprenticeships now so they will pay people like pittance to kind of like do the job and probably build themselves up but we're also living in a generation where we don't have jobs for life anymore anyway so you know when a, a company goes down and people get made redundant and all those types of things you know you have to go into a new career anyway so it's just really kind of strange how how it's set up but you mentioned um a lot of the people that are successful they actually go into business can you just expand on that kind of mindset of you know going into business or even if you're working how can you use the psychology of money to make it work better for you so, um, how, so the first question was, sorry, the first question was going into, going into business. Well, first of all, if you, if you just look, look around everywhere you go, computers are taking over everything. Now you, you don't even need to have someone serving you in Tesco's now. Um, you, you, you can serve yourself, which is annoying because the machine always tells you, you know, that. Oh uh, yeah, put put luggage down. That's annoying in itself. You know, just give me someone to serve me. So that's just jarring. 
Um, you got driverless trucks now. You got you got driverless trains. You go to the go to the airport. You don't even need someone to look at your passport now. The machine does it all. So computers are uh, computers, machinery is taking over everything. They they're talking about um having um. You don't even need someone to post your mail anymore, and we don't even have that much anymore because everyone does emails. So the only way for the economy to change and grow, in my opinion, once again, is for people to start setting up businesses. Because you got businesses, then you then you have employees, and that's what the economy needs. That's what society needs: is more entrepreneurs, more business owners who then start employing people to get the money circulating again. In my opinion. Um, in regards to having a job and then then making an income on this at the same time, I mean, you can you can you can raise yourself up in your job and get paid more money, but once again, in, in my opinion, you need to have multiple income streams. And people hear that all the time. You have to. You need to have multiple income streams. You need to have one income that pays the bills, a second income that you can use to build your wealth. Trying to make it on one income is very, very difficult. It's very challenging. And all you have to do is look at the fact that, you know, everything's typically is going up in price with inflation, but your income's not moving in line with inflation. So you're always falling short. You always got less. I mean, even if you look, I remember, I remember when bus fare used to be 10p. Bus fare ain't 10p anymore. I remember when you can get penny for a penny. Yeah. Penny, penny sweets used to be a penny, you know. How much are penny sweets now? Yeah, penny. Yeah, about five. Really. So, so the fact is, when inflation hits penny sweets, you know we're in bad shape, right? Petrol was eighty-two point nine. Now it's one pound nineteen, one pound twenty-four, depending on where you go. So everything is going up, but your income staying the same. So that means you're always, you've always got less and less and less because everything's going in price, but income's not moving up. So you have to generate more income. You have to find other ways of, of, of making more income for yourself. Now, the challenge is you can do more hours at work if they're available, but you're going to get taxed more. You can go and get yourself a part-time job, but you're going to get taxed more. I, I worked at some figures the other day. I can't remember what they are off by heart, but if I remember right, and I could be wrong, so I'm, I could be wrong, so don't, don't quote me on it. You're better off making, if I'm right, 38 grand a year than making 50 grand a year because of tax. I think if you make 38 grand a year, you actually make your take home is actually more than someone that makes 50 grand a year over the 12 months. I could be wrong. I've got to double check my figures, but I'm sure it was something along those lines because because you, you start hitting the 40% tax bracket. Make 38 is better than making 40 because y y your income just doesn't move in alignment with that stuff. So the reality is everyone needs to make more money, typically. And that reality is going to hit everybody at some point in their life. At some point, you are going to have to pay the price. You're either going to pay the price now or you're going to pay the price later. Now, you pay the price now, it means you have to work harder and smarter for a season of your life, but you get to enjoy all the later years. Or you enjoy yourself now, you don't make any changes, don't make any sacrifices, but you get 65, you're still having to work, not out of, not out of uh, want to and a desire to, but out of a necessity to do that. So you can generate more income at work. Now the challenge is, most people don't want to. Most people, in my experience, Genevieve, in my experience, most people would love to become financially independent. However, they're not prepared to do what financially independent people have done to become financially independent. They're not prepared to take the risks that they've taken. They're not prepared to go through the rejection that they've taken. They're not prepared to, to fail over and over and over and over and over again they're not prepared to do all those things so then they become comfortable um and you know what there's nothing comfortable living hand to mouth paycheck to paycheck salary to salary there's nothing comfortable about falling into your overdraft every single month that's not comfortable for me i can you know i can be comfortable in my house in my tracksuit and trainers but when i get to 65 they ain't comfortable no more and i've still got to go out to work so it's people have got to find other ways to generate generate income and you know what you know what's great like my dad, I love my parents, I love my whole family. Actually, no, there's some people in my family I'm not, not as keen on. No, the, 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 the ones that you, we all got, I mean, it's not even judging me, you got the people who keep at a distance. You see them at a wedding, but you don't really want to talk to them. But um, my dad is very, very entrepreneurial, right? My dad's a builder, self an amazing builder. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to plug him, but I wouldn't let anyone else do any work in my house other than my dad. 
But one of the things he taught me from a young age was how to <laughs> how to generate income and make income for myself. So if I, for example, I'll give you an example. In school, um, I went and bought some black shoes. Um, and my dad taught me how to profile these shoes in school. So I went around wearing these shoes, profiling them, and it was like, right, they're nice. And they cost, at the time, it's going to sound like they were really beat up, mash up shoes. I think they only cost me about four pounds, right? At the time, four pounds was quite a lot of money. So they weren't no, they weren't no like beat up shoes. They were nice shoes. But because I showed them off so much, everyone was like, Daryl, where are you getting them shoes from? I was like, oh, listen, they're eight pounds. I can get you a pair. So I bought them for four pounds, but I sold them for eight pounds. And then as soon as everyone bought them, I stopped wearing the black ones. I went and bought some brown ones. So everyone was like, wait, Daryl, you got brown ones? I said, yeah, them black ones are old, man. But, but Daryl, you bought, I bought them off you yesterday. I said, yesterday's old news. <laughs> These are new, right? Now, don't get me wrong, I could have done that a little bit different. But I didn't know any better when I was 10 years old, 11 years old. But my dad taught me how to <laughs> how to make money for myself um, by just finding a need and, and fulfilling that need for people. Um, and everyone can do that. Once again, it, it's funny, when you put people in desperate situations, they'll find ways of, of they fi- they'll find ways. They'll find ways. And my, my thing is for everyone is, you know, if you're dissatisfied and if you're if you're dissatisfied you know you've got to find something um everyone's goals in life come from an area of dissatisfaction first you know you're dissatisfied by ha- by the house you live in you're dissatisfied by the car that you drive you're dissatisfied by the job that you have you're dissatisfied by the husband or wife. no i'm joking you're dissatisfied by all these things and when you're dissatisfied enough you'll change. And most people change when only when one of three things happens to them. If if they have the right coaches or mentors around them to help them change, if they have the right facts, knowledge and information so they could so they can learn how to change or if their or their situation is painful enough. Now the challenge is most people wait until their situation is painful before they change. My thing is don't wait for it to be painful. Don't wait for your job to be painful for you to change. Put something in in place now. You know, you see so many people around you get made redundant. There was a point when every single day, 1,500 people made redundant at one point. And the moment that you've got all your eggs in one basket, and, you know, people say that, don't have all your eggs in one basket, but you go to work and you have all your eggs in one basket. You have all your whole incomes around this one job and you've seen people made redundant around you and you think that you're safe. And the reality is most people, um, most people are so used to having, you like, you have a, look, I know, don't get me wrong, I know you have run flat tires now. But most people used to have spare tires in their car. Why? Because they could have got, they could have, okay, some of you are going to be smart and say, okay, because my car came with a spare tire. But you have one because you know you could get a flat. So you have a spare tire just in case you get a flat. But you don't have a spare income in case you lose one. And that make no sense to me. It, it really doesn't make any sense to me because most of us are used to having spares. Like you have a spare key for your house in case you lock yourself out of your own house. You have a spare... You have spare light bulbs. Yeah, you have got three or five. Wow, five. How many times have you plan to lock yourself out? <laughs> um, you got some people have like a spare bulb in case of one blows. Some people got spare batteries. I don't know why some people got so many knife and forks. It's only you that lives in the house. You trying to act like you entertain. No, they've been to your house for ages. You only need one or two. But you're so used. To, my point is, you're so used to having spares, but you do not have a spare income. And for me, that is a very dangerous place to be is leaving all your eggs in one basket. Because in most areas of your life, that doesn't make sense. But most of us show up to work every single day, not even thinking about the chance that we could get made redundant. And so you've got to have something else. I want to say, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Genevieve, man. I just like to I just like to rant, man. It's a subject I'm passionate about. And like I said, I'm not motivational. I just provoke people. And I say stuff that, that hopefully touches a nerve and makes people want to change. No, it's, it's brilliant. You're going in and I love, I love the things that you're saying you're thought you know you are thought provoking and it's like the reason why i'm laughing a lot of the time is like oh my god it's so true like <laughs> why did i even see that before so you know it's it's you're hitting a lot of key points but how how can we get to the point where we're actually um we want to be motivated to have a second income what is what is the barrier why is it so difficult to um, you know, to want to do this because you said that um, only a certain type of person. So let's break this down. I want to get to the bottom of of why we have to 
be in our comfort zone and in that kind of pain time to actually get up and do something? I don't know, you know, Genevieve, I think, I think when, when people are pushed, in, pushed into a situation, no choice, no other option, they find a way, do you know, you know, for some people, redundancy is the best thing that could ever happen to you, the best thing that could ever happen to you, I pray that some of you get made redundant, because some, some, some of you listen to this, you've got certain gifts inside of you that you should be exposing to the world, but you're comfortable. And because you're comfortable, you will never go out and and and, sh- and show off your talents and your gifts, and no one else gets exposed. They say that the, the, the um, graveyard is one of the wealthiest places in the world because people get buried with all their gifts and all their talent that was never seen by anyone else. So it always falls down to, for me, for most people, there's an emotional pull. There's either an emotional pull or an emotional push. And some people I've learned, uh, some people are sticks, some people are carrots. Some people you need to beat them into getting, once again, this is not about abuse, just wanted to make sure I made that clear. Some people need to be beaten into to, to, to taking action. Once again, you are dissatisfied about your life. You are dissatisfied about your circumstance. You're dissatisfied about something or other, and you get to a point where you say, enough is enough. Some people are that type of person. Now, some people are, are, are more emotional, poor people, where they're excited by something. They see they they they, they want a house and they do everything they, they 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 can do to get it. They want to buy this car. They want to give to a charity. It's it's going to come from one of those areas first. And what what you'll find is um typically typically uh, please take this in the spirit as that it's intended. Typically, the lower down the social economical ladder you are the less likely you are to have goals that are more than three, four or five years away. So I'll give you an example. What, being a doctor is one of the most respected professions that people, that's out there. But what is it that you really respect? Is it the fact that someone's a doctor is it, or that someone had the foresight to give up five years of their, or seven, five to seven years of their life to study to go into this one profession? that they literally said, for the next five, six, seven years, I'm going to get myself into this amount of debt, I'm going to study for this amount of time, so I can become a doctor. That's what you really respect. If you, th- if you really think about it, that's what you respect. You don't ever say it, you don't really, sometimes you don't even realise it, but that's what you respect. But the lower down the social economical ladder you are, and once again, I, I just kind of say it as it is, you don't think that far ahead. So if you're homeless on the street, for example, you ain't thinking about five years down the road. You're thinking about how do I eat tonight? How do I stay warm tonight? And that's it. Most people don't think that far ahead. Most people have sight but no vision. Yeah, they have not. They don't have something to to, to maybe to, to motivate them. And if you're a parent, if you're a parent, you got some of the best motivation in the world. You just have to look at your child and say to them, "Look," and just think to yourself. You ain't here because you chose to be here. I brought you here. And I have a responsibility to make sure I set up your life in the best possible way and give you the opportunities that I didn't have. There's your motivation right there. Now, that doesn't mean that if you don't have children, go and have some children so you've got some motivation. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that. Because, um, actually, I'll show you some stats. Yeah, if, if you, um, <laughs> It actually costs about, I think it's £31 a day to raise a child. So from the eight, from the age of zero to twenty one, it costs you about two hundred thirty one thousand or two hundred fifty odd thousand. Um, yeah, look at you, Genevieve. You're thinking, how many have you got? <laughs> like, if you needed some two, all right, you got. There's about half a million there to go raise your children from the age of zero to twenty one. If you needed some form of contraception, there it is right there. Even if you weren't sure about having children, I've put you off. Um, guys, listen, I can't help you. I'm just real. I just kind of speak what I'm going to say. Some people are not, like I said, some people are not, I'm subscribed to your channel, Genevieve. I can't help it. Um, but I'm just, like I said, I, just, I like to have fun. This is what I do with finance. If you put the fun factor in finance, people tend to learn more. But going back to your question, um, I think a lot of it is really to do with people not having a strong enough desire by you know people always talk about what is your why what is your why what is your purpose and you got you know i believe that every single person every single individual was put on this planet for a reason just put on this planet for a purpose i don't think no one was here just to occupy space 
there is a calling that everyone has on their life and you just need to find out what that is. But then the other thing is, I think, <laughs> I don't, do you know what? One of the other things is I learned from my dad. Um, he said loads of things to me as a child, like go to your bed before you get beats and all that sort of stuff. But some of the other well, that was one. But the one that really hit home for me, you are standing in a room with your friends and you are the smartest one in that room, you need to go and find some new friends. Because you're not hanging around people that are, that I think be, that are, that are going to push you. You need to hang around with people that are more successful than you, people that make more money than you, people that have got bigger goals than you, people that have more than what you currently have. Because if you hang around that environment, you tend to think bigger. Yeah, and that's what happened for me, to be fair, Genevieve. I used to, I was saving five, six, seven hundred pounds a month when I was teaching. And I was comfortable, which is one of the worst places you can ever be is comfortable because you never push yourself outside of your comfort zone. As I said, I had the mortgage when I was 18 years old, I'm paying for it for, since I was 15 years old. So I was comfortable. But when I started to hang around with people that were more successful than I was, my goals changed. They completely changed. I realized that what, I realized there was more out there. I realized there was more than McDonald's and Nando's and Burger King. I realized there was more than the local restaurant. I realized there was just a lot more out there to, 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 go, and, to go and see. There was areas in, in the UK where I saw houses. I was like, what? How, how comes this person's bathroom is bigger than my, house, than my living room? I didn't get that. I went to someone's house, their, their utility room. You, all you got in there is a washing machine, a tumble dryer. And your utility room is bigger than my whole sitting room. What is that about? And I never realized that that, that that was that was possible and that was available in the UK until I started hanging around with people more successful than I was. And you tend to grow. And you, you have a choice in life. You can either be a goldfish in the Pacific or you can be a killer whale in a fish tank. That's your choices you have. I would rather be a goldfish in the Pacific than a killer whale in a fish tank. You either you either going to be the best of the best, the worst of the best, or the best of the worst. If you had to choose out of those three, you want to be the best of the best. Second thing you want to be is you want to be the worst of the best because if you're the if you if you're the worst of the best, you're better than the rest. But you never want to be the best of the worst because then you're in full you're in a full sense of security. That's when you're hanging around with people that don't think bigger than you are. You want to be the worst of the best, of the best of the best, and that that's the type of mindset that I was brought up with. Um, you know, failure wasn't an option. My dad's self-employed. He said to me, you know, for 10 years of teaching, I never had a day off work and never had a day off sick in, in 10 years. And my, my mindset was, for my dad, was if you're not dead or you're not in hospital, you show up. That was a type of mindset that, that was installed in my life. You show up. And most people don't make it financially because they just don't show up. You don't need to find people that think like you. You need to think, find people that think better than you. Why are you hanging around people that think like you for? I really think like that. I need to find people that think better than me so I can think better. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? And that was really what, how, I, how I thought. Find people that have the same mindset. I want to find people with the same mindset. I want to find people with a better one. So it was always about growth. It's like, it's like muscles. You know, you have to put them under pressure and under continuous strain for them to grow over a period of time. And that's what your brain's like. And that's what hanging around in a different circle is like. So my mentors then became people that were multimillionaires and six figure incomers. And that what became my circle. That became my circle. And there were people that fought better than me. And there were people that fought the same as me, but that became my inner circle of people. It only allowed two, two or three people to speak into my life about money. Everyone else I ain't interested in. I, I was taught to go off something called a power theory. Whoever has the biggest pile of cash, that's who you listen to. That really is it, because they know something that you don't know. Now, understand, it's not all. It's not about just money. Money, um, money don't bring happiness. Do you know what I mean? You can can help, but it don't bring happiness. Um, you can be happy and be broke. Money is simply, <laughs> it's simply all money does is it exposes you. It's an amplifier. It just amplifies what's really in your heart. You know, a good person with money will do good things. A bad person with money will do bad things. Is that, is that if you was a giver when you didn't have money, you're going to be more of a giver when you didn't have money. When you do have money, if you were a criminal when you had money, when you didn't have money, you're going to be more. You're just going to be a bigger criminal with more money. Do you understand what I mean? So all the money does is amplify, and all money does is it gives you choice. It gives you choice, and it gives you options. And what most people in life want is choice and options. Nobody likes to be stuck 
with limited choices and limited options. Money gives you those choices, those options, but it doesn't bring happiness. You've got to find that inner peace, that inner happiness. And I, I find that the, the happiest people are the ones that can have the ability to make more money. Miserable people typically don't. So no one wants to be around miserable people. He wants to be around miserable people. Miserable people don't want to be around miserable people. Misery likes company of other miserable people. Please. I, I remember what your question was, Genevieve. I go in, so I'll get, I'll go, <laughs> on his rest and I'll go off on a tangent. Don't worry, don't worry about it, man. Um, Did I answer your question? Said, probably not. Yeah, go on. Go on. Did I answer your question? I probably didn't. No, no, no. You, you, um, you went in. You, um, you went in. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Everyone's going to be on commenting on your post saying, this guy don't even answer the questions you ask. He doesn't answer whatever you want. <laughs> I've gone off of my questions and I'm writing it, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking. <laughs> um, yeah, um, you said, um, you said, um, oh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, you said amplifying um, what money amplifies you, and you also said that um, money can bring you happiness. So, do you think that? money is the cause of happiness or um something you know can you be happy and broke or can you be wealthy and sad oh yeah most definitely happy doesn't bring happiness i say it can help you to be happy because mm. you know if you've got if you've got money you can buy some of the things that you like it can help with happiness but it doesn't happiness is not doesn't happiness money doesn't make you happy you can be you can have all the money in the world and still be miserable and still be lonely and you can have less money and be content you know like i said money is always it just gives you choices and it gives you an opportunity and now one of my mentors once said to me so Dal, you have this real passion for helping people um but if you want to help poor people the best thing you can do is don't be one poor people you know they don't need your hugging and kisses that's nice they need food, they need shelter, they need opportunities. Being a, so my thing has always been to be in a position in my life where I can give from my overflow, not from my lack. Um, you know, it, it's funny, I, apparently, I don't know how true this is, um, apparently Bill Gates has almost wiped out malaria, so I read, with his wealth. You can't do that being broke. You can't do that struggling financially. When you, have, when you have a certain amount of money, it allows you to do certain things and to sow into other people's lives and give other people opportunities. It's a, it's a challenge to do that, bro. There's loads of things that I want to do, but I don't want the government to fund it. I want to be able to fund that out of my own resources, and I will fund that out of my own resources because then, I, then I'm, not, I'm not a slave to anyone. I, I, have, I have freedom. And that, that's, that, that is what it's really about for me. It's about being financially free. And even when you hear the word and you, and you say it to yourself, being financially free, having no worries, having no concerns about money, not thinking about, oh, I just bought this. Shoot, how's that going to impact me later? Or, oh, shoot, this bill's coming through the post. Oh, man, how can I... F I you're not just having no concerns. Being financially free is when you go to a restaurant and you stop reading the menu from the right to the left and you read the menu from the left to the right. That that do you know what I mean? That's that's not I don't mean careless and carefree. I'm talking about financially free. Because you can do that and be careless and carefree and you suffer for it later. But I'm talking about this is what I want to order and I can afford it, as opposed to twenty pound, nineteen pounds, seventeen pound, fifteen pounds, fifteen pounds, seven pounds, seven pounds, what's that Caesar salad? I'm on a diet. Do you, do you understand what I mean? There's a, there's a difference there. You know, there was a point in my life where, you know, <laughs> you know, you want to end up, you want to go on a cruise, and you don't end up on a cruise. You end up in a pedal boat in Centre Parks. Do you know what I mean? It's it's ha having those those. And I, once again, I don't mean no disrespect to anyone. I just mean that you have options. You have opportunities. There's opportunities out there for every single one of us. But what most of us do, we come across great opportunities. And Winston Churchill said, you come across, we come across great opportunities. And what we do is we dust ourselves down, we pick ourselves up and act like nothing ever happened. It's worse to those effects. Opportunities are out there. Just most people 
walk obliviously to them. It's funny, when you start to focus on certain things, they call that your reticular activating system, your eyes. Um, you start to focus on certain things, they show up. They show up, they just tend to show up in your life, whether good or bad. Whether good or bad, they, they show up in your life. And it just depends on what, what do you focus on. Yeah, they say thoughts become things. So, you know, it's, it's, um, I love. Oh, no, I was going to say, it's like, I, I, every goal that I've had in my life is like deja vu. I ain't surprised mm -hmm. when it happens because I really, I really saw it. Do you know what I mean? I've, I really lived it. I'll give, I'll give you an example, right? Um, I, I, I got it promoted to what we call an executive vice president for, for, for a company that I um, was working with. And when I got there, I worked hard. I worked hard. And people was like, Daryl, you don't seem, you now own a franchise. You don't seem excited. I was like, why should I be? No, but you've worked so hard. Why don't you seem excited? So I was like, I don't understand why I should be. This it's not a surprise. I mean, it's like, it's like this. this I, I was doing a talk in um, Heathrow, Heathrow, Gatwick. I was doing a talk at, in a, in a hotel in Gatwick, and I stood on stage. I said, "Look, people keep asking why I'm not surprised, why I'm not shocked, and it's not nothing to do with an ego thing." He said, "It's like when I jumped in my car this morning, on my sat nav, I put Gatwick Airport." When I arrive at Gatwick Airport, I'm not surprised because that's where I plan to go. If I ended up in Heathrow, now I'm shocked because I put in Gatwick and I ended up in Heathrow. So if you plan for something, why are you surprised when it happens? Now, if you don't plan for it, why are you surprised if it don't happen? Do, do you understand what I mean? So when I say every goal in your life should be like deja vu, is you've lived it, you've seen it, you've been in that place. If any, if any of you are really honest with yourselves and you think about anything that you've achieved in your life, you already knew it was going to happen. There was no doubt, honestly, let's be honest. Like, there's no real serious, serious doubt because if there was real serious, serious doubt, you wouldn't have done it. But you already saw it first. You knew it was going to happen first and you did whatever it took to make sure it happened. Really be honest with yourself. Re really be honest with yourself. And, and the reality is as well. Most of us get caught up and say, oh, I can't take rejection, I can't take pain, what's going to happen, I could fail, what's my friend going to think about me, blah, 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 blah. Now, you need to stop taking advice from certain people, do you know what I mean? If people are making less money than you or the same money or they're just as broke, you know, don't take advice from them, do you know what I mean? It's like them people that give advice about relationships but they ain't never been in a relationship, can't hold down a relationship, ain't married. But, like, if you're going to, it's like getting married, get advice, but get advice from someone that's been married. Or, or, or do you know what? Get advice from someone that's been divorced. At least they're going to tell you what not to do. Anyway. I can't remember what I was talking about now, Genevieve. What am I talking about? What was I saying? Stop laughing at me, Genevieve. I go, I go into these rants, man. I can't help it. Is there cracking up on the screen, Genevieve? I'm trying to have a serious conversation with you. Oh, my gosh. I'll tell you. <laughs> you didn't know it was going to go like this, did you? You didn't know what you was letting yourself in for. <laughs> they didn't warn you about me. No, it's, it's brilliant. I'm sure you're getting the point across like very well. You was talking about um, it, like planning to do something. Why are you surprised? And it's oh. true. Because... Yeah, go on. Oh, sorry to cut you. I remember now. Reality is right. Most of us. This, this is this is how my life changed. When when my, when I saw my mum, um, on a hospital bed with with needles all down her leg, needles all up her arm, tube in her mouth. That, that was a life-changing experience for me. Like, when I'm talking about real life-changing, because at, at that moment there, you know, I, I, I kind of just imagined, it's hard to imagine, but you imagine your mum not being around anymore. And this person that carried you for nine months has, has kind of brought you up is not around. And that's, that, that feeling alone if anyone who's lost somebody, that's scary, man. It's scary because it's like they're just not here anymore. They're never going to be around them more. You may feel them, you may feel them in your spirit, you may see pictures, but it, none of that stuff brings that person back. Um, and that was a scary moment for a period of time. There's a point when I knew she was going to be okay. But for a period of time, it was one of the scariest things that I ever, ever went through was the thought of losing my mum. That was scary.
after she came around, me and my mum were close. Me, and my, I love my mum, but you know, we weren't close. Me and my dad were like brothers, brothers. Me and my mum, my job in life was to wind her up. That, that was what I thought my job was in life, and you know, it was to see if she would beat me, and I'd just stand there and block it. That that was what I honestly thought my job was in life. But the moment, the moment I almost lost her, was was a turnaround in my life. Um, in the sense of after that, every single day without fail since the age of fifteen, I've told my mum I love her. Um, every th- challenge that I've had in my life since that point. I always turn around and say, do you know what? Is this is this really that hard? I almost lost my mum. This is nothing in comparison to that. But what's the worst thing that's going to happen? And that that's really what, what that whole thing that happened with my mum and my dad and them separating was really about. It what it taught me is if I could overcome that experience, there were things in life. Everything else in life is nowhere near as scary as that for me um so uh, <laughs> it's funny like my, my biggest goal now is as far as i'm concerned i'm, I'm my parents pension plan so it's to turn around and say mum has 50k pups here's 50k do with it as you please and when you run out come back to me for more every other goal after that doesn't have the same weight for me now because i know that when you give away 100k I don't have to think about it. Everything other gold is going to going to happen by default, but because I don't know how long I, they've got, I don't know how long I've got. I don't know if I'm going to go first. Um, there's a real urgency there. I don't have time to wait. I don't have time to procrastinate. I don't have time to waste. There's a real urgency to get that job done because I want them to enjoy themselves. As far as I'm concerned, they brought me up and they raised me, and my job is to to give back and to give them the lifestyle that they deserved and they worked hard for. So it's putting things into perspective for me. So, so for example, Genevieve, you, you've got two children, right? How, how old are they? Now I'm going to interview you for a second. My children are 12 and seven. They're, they're 12 and seven. And you, I'm assuming you went through nine months of labor. Well, for both of oh, Sorry, nine <laughs> months of pregnancy. Nine months of labor is tough. That's real tough. <laughs> I think mean, you went through nine, nine, nine months of pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah, but both times. And yeah. how long was you in labour for? Um for the f- probably about um, the first one was about nine hours, the first one was about seven the second one was about seven hours. Okay. For those nine months, was there ever at any times when you were uncomfortable? Oh Lord. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing that's a yes, like having to go <laughs> every five minutes, can't lie, can't lie on that side, can't lie on that side. This thing inside you is just kicking you non stop. But there was some discomfort mm. there, right? Mm. Yeah. You went through seven yeah. and nine hours worth of labor. Was that quite painful? Definitely, yeah. Quite is yeah. quite painful. Yeah. Yeah. And in that yeah, moment, most... there. Yes. Sorry. It was the most painful thing that I've experienced. The most painful thing that you've experienced. Now, first thing is in that moment there that you was on the bed, um, giving birth. Did you care about your appearance? <laughs> no, you didn't, you didn't give two hoots about your appearance. No. I said two hoots. I didn't use the other D words, right? So I was, I was, I was going live. So I'm trying to be, keep it real. Um, you didn't care about your appearance. So most people, when they go through challenges, they're more concerned about what it looks like and what they look like, what people are thinking. You didn't think, oh, shoot, I've got to put my makeup on oh, my hair's all up. I'm going to put my lipstick on, my eyeliner, my eyelashes. Oh, no. So you didn't care about anything. You were just in pain. And then, after your, your 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 son popped out, and they handed the babies over to you, what happened? Well, I forgot all of that. It, it was just um, just a life in my hands. So whatever happened before, I didn't really care because I I had the, the child in my hand. You just forgot about the pain, right? Mm-hmm. Just completely forgot about it because you had this child in your hand that you are now you, know, you carried for nine months that you are now responsible for. And all that discomfort over the nine months suddenly just goes. The, the seven to nine hours of pain, you kind of just forget about, I'm assuming based on what you've just said, because you've got this life in your hand. And that's what achieving your goals is like, to a certain degree and becoming financially independent. You're gonna have these areas of, of challenges and discomfort, 
and you can't be too concerned about what you look like to everyone else and what everyone else is thinking about you. But then when you get to the end and you have this life form or this goal or you've achieved it, you forget about most of the challenges. It's not that you forget about them, but the pain and the discomfort, those things suddenly just go out of your mind because you've achieved the goal. And that's why I say a lot of the goals for me are that deja vu. I've already seen them. I've already thought about some of the challenges I've experienced. So none of the challenges are a shock. There are some that you think, oh, where did that come from? But none of them I'm really shocked by. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to be shocked. I'm prepared for the challenge. I'm prepared for the frustrations because my goals are more important than any challenge that I'm about to face. Me achieving the goal is more important because quitting is not an option. Failure is not an option. You either win or you learn, you win or you lose. You've got those two choices. You've got to decide which one. Yeah. So this is not, it's just not an option for me. And it should be, and that's how everyone should think, you know, failure is not an option. It's just not an option. Quitting is not an option. Because once you quit on one thing, quitting becomes a habit to you. So you quit on the next challenge. You quit on something else or you aspire to. You quit on something and you just, you just end up being a quitter. And you've got to make a decision and decide, this is where I want to go. These are all the things I want to have. I'm going to do whatever it takes to achieve it. Some goals that I have in life, I don't even have a, they say you should have smart goals. They should be specific, specific. it should be measurable, it should be attainable, it should be realistic, it should be time bound. Do you know what? I'm going to be honest. Some goals I have, I don't even have a time for them. I just know they're going to happen. So I don't have a, a set time because I know there's a process that I've got to go through first. So some of them I don't have no time because they're going to happen. I just know, I just know they're going to happen. Some of them I have, I have time bound. Some of them are, are some goals are just, I don't, some of them are not too far ahead because I need to have some goals that, some of them are far ahead, but there's certain goals I have, what I call pit stop goals, that I get excited by. There's like a goal that I have within 30 days that's a really small goal, but I get excited by it. And I work towards the small goals because they lead me to the bigger ones. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I can't remember what you asked me again. <laughs> 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 it was, um, you were talking about um, the way um people kind of, the egotistical way of people thinking or people thinking that it's egotistical to say that you are going to definitely achieve something but you broke it down really well um that, well if you know it's going to happen and you're that sure of yourself and i think that's one of the key things that i was trying to like kind of pick from your brain today for you to kind of explain um what you know how you know that psychology of and it's not even necessarily about money it's about just your whole mindset of what you're going to do because it doesn't have to be money orientated it's just a general kind of okay if i'm going to do something i'm going to achieve it i'm not going to think about if when maybe how or one day i would like or i don't think i can do you, you know what i mean we're telling ourselves all these stories and we're just finding excuses of not to go in that goal and so it's um it's key to kind of understand that the the surety that you have of what you're doing and you know you're very clear and concise on, on, on what you want to achieve and I think that's a, a lot of people, especially like even leading up to this interview and talking to people about their kind of money mindsets and stuff, it, it's really apparent, like you said, even in like maybe certain communities, maybe um, certain income brackets, that people's understanding of, and even the way um, money works is, is kind of, it's not, I suppose it's flawed for uh, want of a better word because they just feel that oh well if it happens it happens but I'm not going to really do anything to try. So um, the next question that I wanted to really just um, get you to go into quickly is on um, the people's relationship with money because especially being a you know a black girl that was growing up in church like that yeah apparently. <laughs> Um, being a black girl growing up in um, church um, you're kind of taught not to be too you know not being too ambitious not being too you know wanting to achieve high money money goals and stuff like that it's probably not even necessarily said but 
just in the way you know money is well it's the root of all evil apparent that's what it says in the bible even though it's translated to money is evil um so I, what i've noticed um as well there's a lot of people who have an issue with say for example you're an entrepreneur and you have a business and maybe your business is um and and um, you want to put on an event for maybe it's a community event or maybe it's, um, you know, maybe I don't know, maybe it's a dance, I don't know, it's an, an event that you're putting on. And then um, people will turn around and say, oh, well, if you're doing something for the community, you shouldn't be charging for that event. Or if you're, um, if you're creating something, especially when it's um, like a service rather than a because that's another thing as well. We've got an issue with like kind of buying knowledge. So if it's a service rather than a product, why are you charging for that service? Why are you charging for that knowledge? Do you know what I mean? It's like all these all these kind of conversations I've had with people, and it's very interesting um, to kind of understand. Um, people feel that they see somebody that is maybe charging for something or you know have providing a service or whatever whatever yeah. they they feel that they're doing something wrong and another thing that i've noticed as well is that when people do become successful now everyone is hating on them especially if they come from a background where they wasn't expected to like when they get somewhere Everyone's like, oh, they think they're too nice. Now they've got money. Oh, they're living in a big house. They've got driving a big car or whatever, whatever the case may be. Can you kind of break any all of this down? Is it just all in my head or is, or is this a general thing that happens? Okay. I'll, you might have to remind me of some of them. So I'll go back to the first, one of the first points you made is that it, in the Bible it says money is the root of all evil. No, it doesn't. It says the love of money is the root of all evil so the love of money is the root of all evil you cannot serve two masters it talks about so um it is funny from my understanding from my understanding the majority of the scriptures or a good portion of the scriptures in the bible talk about money the bible talks about how to live your life holistically whether it's family faith money what have you health all of those sort of things but yet you've got a lot of people that are of the face that are struggling financially. But you've got a whole manual, how to live your life. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, I still make mistakes. Every single day I make mistakes. I'm trying to make new ones every day. I do my best to make new ones, not the same ones, again, because then you'll start going into insanity mode. Um, but my, my goal is to make new mistakes every single day. I haven't made the same ones before. Yes, I have. Like all of us, I'm not perfect. No one is. The only perfect person got crucified. I'm not looking to go down that route. But... Um, it, it, it's it's just it's just interesting it's very interesting because you can get that but then you know you want tithe and offering but we want to talk about money um we have <laughs> you, know, you know i've learned in life not your your real friends genevieve your real friends your bona fide friends your your, your real family um they don't ever hate on you when you when you start making doing well for yourself but i've also learned that sometimes in life you got to count your success by the amount of haters that you have. And some people just got to really get their head around that one. Sometimes you have to count your success by the amount of haters that you have, not by the amount of cheerleaders that you have. Your haters more often than not will follow you more than your followers do. Your haters can be are sometimes your biggest fans because they want to. They're just sitting there waiting for you to make a mistake. They're waiting for you to fail. They're waiting for you to come. Go ah! I knew you was gonna flop. I knew you was gonna fail. So sometimes you just gotta go. Okay, there's another hater. How many more haters are we gonna get? There's one. There's two. There's three. There's four. There's five. There's and just go. There you go. That's just a part of it. Your real friends never, ever, ever. The real friends, they don't hate on you. They will cheerlead you. They will. They will be there for you. They'll be there to support you. One of my friends told me once. Um, so if you were to get locked up in prison, you got. The friends that will phone you to see if you're right. Well, you've got the friends that will ask someone, say, oh, have you heard about, about X, Y, Z that was in prison? Do you know if you're all right? You've got the ones that will phone you. You've got the ones that will be that will visit you. And you've got the ones that are sitting right next to you saying, man, that was real dumb what we did. 
Now, I've got some friends, I wouldn't do that, right? Sorry, I'm going to be the one that phones you and may not even visit because that's stupid. If something stupid, it's stupid. But do you, do you understand what I mean? Your real friends are there for you, ride or die. Your real friends are there when you're in the trenches, when you're in the valleys, when you're on top of the mountain. They're with you all the way through. So, you know, you, you're always going to have haters and, and you know what? You're always going to be judged. And if you're going to worry and concern yourself about that, the best thing to do if you don't want to be judged, hated, is don't do nothing, don't say nothing, but you probably ain't gonna have nothing, and you probably won't be nothing. So you you got a you you your life is not about the the haters. Your life is about what you were called to do, what you were called to achieve. There's hardly there's, I don't know if there's anyone out there that's highly successful that doesn't have a hater or two. So you mentioned you mentioned um, the Bible. Pretty sure Jesus had some haters, you know. He had quite a few haters and a number of haters. We know what happened to Jesus, right? So he had some haters. So for those of you that are Christian and people of the faith, it doesn't matter whether you are or you're not, but if you are, Jesus has some haters. You're going to have some haters. You're trying to be Christ-like, <laughs> expect some haters then if you're trying to be Christ-like, isn't it? <laughs> that's, the way I, that's just the way I see it. So there, there's that. There's that. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. All you need to know is that you are, you are true to yourself. You're true to your, your goals, your mission, your crusade. You're true to all of those things. And if you know that everything that you do is with this, not only the spirit of excellence, but you have the spirit to help and serve other people, then you can sleep comfortable at night. You know, you're going to have the people that judge you. Nothing you can do about that. Accept that. That comes as part of the territory for success. It also comes as part of the territory for failure. You're still going to have haters. No matter how good you are, no matter how bad you are, people are always going to judge you. You kind of just have to get over that and accept that is part of life. And you, other people's opinion of you is not your business. So just mind your business. As in, like, mind your business. Don't worry about what everyone else has got to think and say. Now, yeah, don't get me wrong. If you're in a business and you want to hear other people's feedback and opinion for you to improve, but the people that don't know you, why do you worry about it? Do you know what I mean? I've had I've had haters in my life. I've had people that don't like me. I've had people when I've when I've achieved certain things, they've spoken about me behind my back. Do you know what though? I don't lose any sleep over it, you know, because not not one of them pays my bills. Not one of them pays for my light. Not one of them pays for my mortgage. Not one of them tucks me in at night. Not not one of them brings me breakfast in the morning. I don't care. Do you know what I mean? Because if you spend too much time worrying and concerned about what other people think, you will not do anything because you're too scared about what other people think and i'm just like i don't care man life is a long people say life is short life is the longest thing we do on this planet so i'm looking to enjoy it and i enjoy it with people that i enjoy my life with you know i have it i've got only hang around environments that i like i only hang around with people that i enjoy being around and if i can't build with you i don't chill with you and if i can't chill with you i won't build with you and, and it's really that simple it really, really is that simple. So, I don't know, what were some of the other things you mentioned, Genevieve? I think I caught the Bible one. I think I got the haters one. Yeah. What was the other one? Yeah, it was um, just about why people feel that they can't um, actually, they feel, well, yeah, you covered, like, with being successful, but, um, it, you know, if somebody's, like, created a business out of something and they want to charge people for... Uh -huh you know, for a service, why are people hated? And it's especially when um, somebody is either deemed as maybe like in a religious environment or they, they're trying to do something um, maybe as um, for the community, like a philanthropist or, you know, somebody that is doing something good. And then when it, when it equates to money now, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. Whereas if it's just like, you know, cutthroat finance, city in London, you know, breaking deals and taking money out of people's pensions and stuff like that, oh, that's not a problem. So can um, you break down that kind of psychology? I don't know if I can break it. Like, I don't really understand that mindset. I just think that some people, you know, I could easily go, you say you're cheap, isn't it? You're cheap. But I think a lot of people just don't understand the value and the time that people put into to things to give back and to serve. So, you know, we've, there's, 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 there's value that if someone's adding value, be prepared to pay for it. 
um, what's, what's really interesting is people will pay for all sorts of nonsense. I mean, no, and I'm talking about like nonsense. But then when someone's trying to build a business or make a difference or help something or do something in the community, you want to go, ah, but it's for the community. Why are you paying for it? Well, just, just, just be real, isn't it? Just say, I don't want to pay for it because I'm cheap. No, no, I offended some of you. Well, I did, so it was tough. But, but that, that's, that to me is the wrong mindset because the next thing you know, when you want to go out and do something, you reap what you sow. Yeah, so when you go out and decide that you want to do something, you cannot cuss when people don't go and support you or don't want to buy your product or don't want to buy your service because you were acting the same way. Do you understand what I mean? I've, oh, I, I'm, I'm at a point now where I, <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you a joke, right? When I first, before I went into business, right? it's not really a joke, it's not funny, but uh, when I first went into business, or before going into business, I should say, I used to hear about business people. Oh, they get they pay someone to iron their clothes, or they pay someone to to mow their lawn, or they pay someone to cook for them. And I used to think to myself, this was my but this was my mindset. So I'm not coming from a place where I've always thought right. I come from a place where I've also thought wrong and then seen it differently. I said, but wait, they're lazy, isn't it? Like you're paying for someone to iron your clothes, iron your own damn clothes. You're so lazy. Yeah, I said, damn. Um, Go, go and mow your own lawn. You're so lazy. And this was the mindset that I had, that you were lazy because you were paying someone to mow your lawn and iron your clothes and do all of those things. And then I realized that what wealthy people do, business people do, is they work on their strengths and then they hire their weaknesses. They hire people to do things that they are not necessarily good at, or is not a good value. It doesn't add value. It's not a good use of their time. I remember when I was hanging out with um, one of my mentors um, at his house in Nice. And I went to his house just a couple of years ago, and um, I stayed there for I think it was about four days a week. That's not important. And I went. To, I said to him, "I need to iron some clothes. Um, where's, where's your iron?" And he looked at me like I asked the dumbest question. Is that like, huh? Your iron? Where's, where's, where's your iron? Jack? Hmm? So do you, um, and the, the thing is, I'm, I'm thinking that he's not, uh, he lives in Nice, but he's not, he's not French, so he, he speaks English. So, so I'm actually starting to mind me. I said, you know, the, the, the iron, the iron, and he, took, and he calls his wife, I'm not going to say her name, because I don't want to expose, he calls his wife and said, wife, do we, do we have, do we have an iron? And she goes, I think, I think we have one in the room in the corner behind the box. And he told me to go look there. His iron was dusty, yeah, and the iron board. And then I, he turned to me and said, Dow, I don't iron clothes. Pay someone to do that for me. So I don't know where all of this stuff is. But you don't become a millionaire by ironing clothes. Now, don't get me wrong, you can have an ironing business. So, you know, you understand what I'm saying. And, you know, you could buying clothes and make some money and invest it so yeah, okay we're not talking about that but i'm talking about you cannot if you the moment that you okay look okay let me let me touch some nerves now gosh chuck right the moment that if you're in business and you're doing mowing your lawn now you may enjoy mowing your lawn don't get me wrong you may enjoy it but you could pay say you say you could pay someone 10 pound an hour to do that the moment you decide that you are going to mow your own lawn you have decided that you are now worth ten pound an hour. In those two hours, if you're in business, you know you could make five hundred, a thousand pound, maybe more. But you're you've made the decision because you were tight, because you were tight, because you were tight, that you were going to go and pay. You were going to go and mow your own lawn, but you didn't really see the value of your time. And that's where the, when I understood when people say, um, "What's that saying?" Um, buying time. That's when I really understood it buying your time that paying people to do stuff so you get back your time i had a revelation when i heard that i i actually at one point i used to have someone that used to cook dinner for me now it's not because i can't cook i can cook yeah i know how to clean chicken with lemon and water or vinegar so i'm just letting you guys know i know how to clean chicken and season it let it marinate overnight so i'm using the right terminology so you know that i know i'm talking about cook it bake it whatever i want to do whatever you want to do with it right but at one point there was someone who was a, that I knew that was a, a single mom, two children, uh, was studying, was not working. And I said to her, look, I need to, um, I don't have time to cook 
you know, I was, I was cooking on a Sunday, taking up my whole day cooking for the week. And I said to her, excuse me, I said to her, listen, you, you cook for your children every day, right? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, if I was to do all your food shopping for you and give you all the meat you needed, the rice, chicken, veg, all that stuff, and bought all your food shopping, not your toiletries, that's your business, but your food shopping, how much does that normally come to a week? She was like, oh, about 80 odd pound a week, maybe more. Blah, blah, blah. I said, well, if I was to do that for you, I think it was less than that, actually. Would you be prepared to put on an extra two pieces of chicken or extra four pieces of chicken for me so I've got food for lunch when, I, when, I'm, out on the, when I'm out working and some more food when I come back in the evening? Because I said, you're cooking anyway. All you got to do is throw in an extra four pieces of chicken or an extra portion of what have you, extra two portions. Said, yeah, cool. So in me buying her shopping so she could have food, it allowed me to use the time that I wasn't doing that to go out and help more people and generate more income. Now that worked in the V for about two months until she realized how much money I was making. And they said, Daryl, can you just give me another job to come and work with you? I don't want to cook for you no more. I want to go and do what you're doing. So I took her, I took her run, took her run. And uh, within the first kind of, I think about the first three weeks of me working with her, in three weeks, just from scratch training, she made seven hundred pound. Do, do you know what I mean? In, in three weeks, so, so three weeks or four weeks of me training, uh, teaching her what to do, I made seven hundred pound. I lost my chef at that point, but I was more excited that she found another way to generate an income. Do you understand what I mean? So when people are not prepared to pay for certain things, what you're saying is you don't have, you don't give, and you have not put any value on what you're about to receive from it. You're not putting any value on the person's, and you're not putting any value on them. So I just think I just think no, I pay for certain things, man. Pay your way in it. Just just contribute. Contribute. Sometimes you just got to contribute. I was at an event the other day where someone was saying I need to get my business up and running, and I've been struggling to get it up and running for for ages. Um, been working on it for years, and I said, "How much do you need to get your business up and running?" You went fifteen hundred pound. I said, "But wait, you need fifteen hundred pound." You need fifteen hundred pounds to get your business up and running. You've been working for years to try and get there. So listen, my friend, and I turned around to there was about a hundred and something odd people in the room, and I worked out that I said, "Listen, everyone, would you be prepared to give this guy eleven pound fifty, or was eleven pound forty seven, so he would have fifteen hundred pounds so he can get his business up and running?" Everyone said yes. I said, "Listen, man, you got to be creative. You don't ask. You don't ask. You don't get it. Not he can ask." Yeah, all adjectives. You must do something. You can't just sit there pray and wait. You can't just sit there expecting things to happen to you, go and get your ass off of the couch and take action in it. Just sit in there. Let me sit there and pray. Uh, I'm praying. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to imagine it into my life. Uh, I'm going to imagine one day it's going to happen. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to just imagine all this money coming to me. But you ain't putting no work to do it. Get real. Get real, mate. <laughs> There's action involved. Do you know what? Everyone's saying, I want to have a passive income. Do you know what? Passive income ain't passive. I mean, you got to work. You got to go and work for passive income until passive income works for you. Financial freedom is not free. You got to go and pay the price for financial freedom. Stop, stop the nonsense, man. Char. What was the next question, Genevieve? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Just, I'm getting because uh, you know you're talking and I'm hearing all because I'm I'm sitting here and I'm imagining and I'm remembering all the things that people have said to me over the time and it's bringing me back to the place where I've had to cuss at certain times. And like I said, I'm a realist. I say what I've got to say, and I don't, I don't, I don't apologize for what I'm saying. You don't have to agree with it. It's my opinion, and my opinion is right to me. You can completely disagree with it. I step on toes, but I say what I say because I say it with love because my my heart is in the right place. I want to provoke you into taking the right actions. If I provoke you and you take the right actions, then I'm good. A coach ain't there to be loved. The coach is there to 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 get you to where you need to be. I agree, hundred percent. Now you've just not the nail on the head with that really you've just given people so much food for thought i can't i i just I, i'm done yeah <laughs> i'm done you sit still delivered trust me this so is the Darryl, point where, this is the point where i just pick up the mic and i just drop the mic and I walk <laughs> the yeah, it's, that's that point <laughs> Daryl, we need to know how can we um how can you help people how can you help people with all the things that you've spoken about? Um, how can you help them to get to that next level? So what, one of the things that I do, one of the things that I, I have an organisation that is, basically we run a financial education company. 
So we educate people on money and finance. I know we didn't do a lot about talking about money as such today. We did a lot of the, the mindset stuff, which is, you know, that's where it starts, in my opinion. Um, but we teach people about money and finance, just educate them, showing people how to pay their debts off sooner if it's relevant, showing people how to knock years off their mortgage. A lot of people don't realise that you could actually knock five to eight years off of your mortgage. You don't have to change interest rates, but with the same money you put on that mortgage every month will knock years off. But they don't realise that. And the thing is, information will change the situation. And you know what you know. You just don't know what you don't know, and it's what you don't know that can hurt you. Showing people how to get their money working a lot harder for them. Um, showing people how to save money and, and grow their money. So these are things that we do. So we, we probably spend, like I do, I do, funny enough, I do a seminar with a good friend of mine, business partner called The Psychology of Money, which we just come off doing two in the space of two months. We did one, and people was like, when's part two? It was like, we don't, there ain't no part two. There's only part one. Um, so we don't. We, so people ask for us to do do another one because they're friends and family that missed it. So we do that. But that's something I do. That's another thing I do. I speak in schools to, to young people about money. I get called into churches to talk about money. I get called into organisations. I sit down with families in their homes, really just educating and empowering people to understand certain things in the financial sector. But then at the same time, there's people that I can. If people need help in certain areas, I can direct them to people. Been been doing this for so long now. There's networks and companies that if someone needs, I can go, go here, go here, go here, go here, go here, go here. And I'm not going to name them now because it's not, I'm not going to plug that stuff. Um, so that's what we do. And funny enough, do you know what, Genevieve? Uh, you got, for those, for those cheap people that don't want to pay for stuff, we actually do it for free. We do it for free. Wow. And you think, well, what's the catch? What, what price do you have to pay? The only thing that you have to do, do is you've got to pay attention when I'm sitting down with you. That's it. You've got to pay attention. And the only thing that it's going to cost you is your time. But it's the time that you invest in that that could change your life. There may be just one or two things that may be able to help you financially. So we'll sit down, do the education about you for money, helping you, helping you sort out your assets, secure your assets, um, putting things in place for your family, your loved ones, your children, uh, and then putting together what we call a whole financial game plan, which will show you exactly how to move from where you are, wherever that is now, to exactly where you want to be. So if people want you to contact me, um, you can contact me on my, I'm going to give you my personal, my personal, my personal email account is uh, Daryl, Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L. So it's D-A-R-Y-L. So Daryl at Daryl Harper, impactme.com. So it's Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L at Daryl Harper, D-A-R-Y-L, H-A-R-P-E-R at impactme.com. So if you just email there, um, myself or one of my my assistants office managers will be in will be in touch brilliant and i will actually put that email on the description bar so lazy people not not lazy people people that may have missed it, <laughs> people that may have missed it um can just click on it you know highlight control um what is it control c um, if you're going to contact me Sorry, Genevieve, because I have to say, I always have to put my disclaimers out there. I will say what I've got to say, how I've got to say it, and I'm going to say it with love. But if you are going to contact me, please be in a position where you want change. You know, I, I value your time. Uh, I don't want to waste your time. Uh, I definitely do not want to waste my time or any of my team's time. So if you're in a position where you, you want change in your life from a financial perspective, you want to get some coaching, some mentoring, some help uh, to do that, then please contact but if you're not in that position if you don't want change then then don't do that you're gonna you're all wondering how comes we do it for free don't worry about it. when we, we listen this, this is what i'm gonna say to you hide your money hide your checkbook hide your credit cards hide your jewelry now say we don't want no money from you we don't want no money from you and you're wondering how is you gonna do it about no money where's the catch no catch hide your money hide everything we only want to only want to work with people that want change and want a financial breakthrough or just or even just some guidance you might be doing well financially but you just want to you want confirmation you want some guidance in the right in the right direction yeah explain some of that terminology for financing <laughs> definitely okay well Daryl, it's been brilliant i think we've been going for an hour and a half time flies when you're catching joke because this is <laughs> Seriously, I never thought I would love so much on a, on a serious topic like money. But it's been an absolute pleasure having you to come on 
and I think maybe we might have to come back again and then um, maybe go into some other dynamics because it's been mm. you've got to really be like I, I'm, I'm getting fed up of having to write all these notes. Oh, so oh JP, I'm, I'm losing you again. I'm losing you again, my dear. I'll like, hold on. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. Okay, yes, I was just saying this. You know, this is now going to be a lot of time. Let's do it again, Jimmy. I think we have the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, carry on talking. Yep, 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 stay right there. I won't leave. So, yeah, um, what I was saying is, um, you know, maybe we, um, I'd love for you to come back on the show, um, in a, you know, whenever you're available. But definitely, um, I just hope that people will contact you, um, you know, to get the support because you have provided some brilliant information. And, you know, the realness of it, I think, is what makes it more impactful as well. Because when you say things straight, it's just like where well, you can't argue with straightness you can't argue with truth do you know what i mean so you know you could you could like water it down and make it sound like oh well it's not that bad but when we're in especially with financial situations where we're in, when you're in a bad way or you need some help or guidance it's a serious thing so it needs to be impactful so i'm just so glad that you do what you do and you know um that was helped like thousands of people in terms of their finances and getting to a different place so you know he knows what he's doing and he can definitely guide you and he's got a great team behind him so i just want to thank you so much for coming on the show and um and all that information and um, is there anything else you want to say before we close out uh, I just want to thank you Genevieve because you know what you, you've been doing this you've been putting the, this content together for everyone uh, yeah, so I just want to commend you because this is your time and that you're investing and, and and time is valuable, you know what I mean? And for you to give up your evening or invest your evening to, to give back to everyone that's watching this, um, I just support, you know, support Genevieve and what she's doing. Even if you don't like me and my content and you want to boo underneath, that's fine. That's not Genevieve's fault. She didn't even know what was going to come out of my mouth. But just, just support, support the cause and, you know, just understand that, you know, you guys, everyone that's listening to this, you, you can there's greatness within you and there is a better version of you than you're currently operating in, you know, like windows, um, not plugging windows, but you know, we go through updates and every single one of us has an update and I understand that you most of us are in the position that we are currently in until we learn what we need to learn for us to occupy the space that we were called to occupy. That was quite deep. I don't even know what I just said. And I asked me to repeat it, but until you get to a certain place mentally, um, you're not going to be able to occupy an, a certain space. So just understand that if you're prepared to, to invest the time just to change, there's some amazing books out there, there's amazing stuff that you can watch for free on YouTube. And that's, that's the funny thing is a lot of the stuff that I've used to help me, I, you know, my, my parents you know, and my family have been great mo role models to me. And that's where I've always looked to. I've never looked, really looked on someone on TV as a role model. I saw how my parents lived. Um, regardless of what my mum, what my mum did, and what have you, I saw how they they lived in their hearts and for what they do. Be be the best role model that you can be for for anyone, for your children, for your family, and aim to just become better every day. You know, the amazing thing is if you just focus on becoming one percent better every every month, you're twelve percent better than than you were the previous year. That's more than most businesses improve by. But you just got to make you got to be actively interested in becoming. Um, successful and improving and and be curious my thing is always be be curious you know I, I, and that's that's one of the things that really worked for me is I'm curious about things they say curiosity killed the cat no, I didn't curiosity made people millionaires someone was curious one day I said I wonder what would happen if I flipped the switch and this light came on I wonder what would happen if I made something that I could communicate with people across the pond and across the world I wonder what it, would look, what it looks like if you go past the atmosphere that was curiosity so my thing is be, be curious and be consistent. Um, there is a better version of you waiting to come out. Just allow it to come out. And just sometimes just you just need to get out of your own way. Get out of your own way and take a leap of faith. What's the worst thing that can happen? 
you know, ask yourself, what is the worst thing that can happen? If you can overcome the worst thing, you may as well just go for it. And that's, that's closing. So thank you guys. Thank you guys for watching to the end. Um, Cause only those of you that heard that last part was watching to the end. So thank you guys for watching to the end. Um, once again, continue to support Genevieve and Jenny Vision, and just thank you so much for your time. I hope you got something out of that talk, and I really do appreciate your time that you've given for this this uh, live video stream. Oh, thank you again. Okay, guys, well, we're going to close out now. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, again, I've got a lot of beautiful thoughts to go to bed with tonight. Focus, direction, and don't care about the haters. The haters are good because they support you sometimes more than the <laughs> than your fans. Like it's just crazy. Like especially in this trolling stage, this this social media stage, you don't even know who they are and they're chatting. But it's all good. Um I've got one more clip. Yeah. Like, say that I'll again. I've got one more for you. Yeah. Everything that you currently do between nine and five o'clock, that's to pay your bills. Everything you do after five o'clock that's an investment in your future. Just ask yourself, what are you investing in after five o'clock? Is it TV, dead enders, something else? Facebook, Instagram? Or are you investing in something for your future? I'll say that one more time. Everything you currently do between nine and five o'clock, that's to pay your bills. That's your survival income. Everything after five o'clock, that's your investment in your future. Find something else that's going to help you get to where you want to get to financially. Brilliant. That's so true. So turn off the TV, guys, and put on Genovision Media. Learn some <laughs> stuff. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, thank you very much. And um, see you again soon. And, you know, just enjoy the rest of your evening. And good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.